In the 3rd century CE, Rome faced one of its most turbulent periods, aptly named the Crisis of the 3rd century, or the Imperial Crisis, spanning from 235 to 284 CE. During these tumultuous 50 years, over 20 different emperors ascended to the throne in rapid succession. To put this in perspective, in the 208 years leading up to 235 CE, there were a mere 26 emperors. The rulers of this time, often referred to as barracks emperors because of their close ties to the military, frequently pursued their personal ambitions and interests, often ahead of the welfare of the empire itself. While a few of these emperors exhibited qualities worthy of leadership, the prevailing climate emphasized immediate and tangible results from those in power, even if such results did not necessarily align with the best interests of the people. The crisis commenced when Emperor Alexander Severus, 222-235 CE, chose to pay German tribes for peace rather than engage them in battle. His troops, deeming this act dishonorable, revolted and killed him. Such an audacious action against a reigning emperor was previously unthinkable but became disturbingly commonplace during this era, almost amounting to a death sentence for those elevated to the imperial position. The death of Alexander Severus set a new precedent for rulers. Emperors now relied on the goodwill of the military, particularly their own legions, to maintain power. The ability to shape Rome according to one's vision became secondary to appeasing the military and securing their loyalty. Simultaneously, Rome grappled with a series of predicaments including plague, inflation, and internal issues. It also faced external threats from so-called barbarian tribes and others who either aimed to overthrow the empire or escape the chaos that plagued it. Some of the primary adversaries of Rome during this period included King Cniva of the Goths and possibly King Canabords and Cniva was the Gothic king who achieved the remarkable feat of defeating Emperor Decius at the Battle of Abritus in 251 CE. He led the Goths in besieging the Roman city of Nicopolis and successfully captured Philippopolis, resulting in the deaths of over 100,000 Roman citizens and the enslavement of survivors. Emperor Decius and his son also perished in the battle. Cniva displayed strategic prowess, exploiting the terrain to his advantage. After Abritus, Cliva's activities are less well documented, and it is unclear whether he is the same leader as King Canabords, who was killed in a clash with Emperor Aurelian around 270 CE, and King Shapur I of the Sassanid Persians and his successor, Hormes I, presented a formidable challenge to Rome. Their reigns marked the rise of the Sassanid Persian Empire as a significant adversary. Shapur I notably captured the Roman Emperor Valerian, making him the first emperor to be taken captive, and Postumus, a Roman governor, declared independence and formed the Gallic Empire in 260 CE. Following his rule, a series of rulers including Marius, Victorinus, Domitianus, and Tetricus I presided over the Gallic Empire. Tetricus I, who reigned from 271 to 274 CE, was one of the most notable figures of this period, and Zenobia, the queen of the Palmyrene Empire, embarked on a bid for autonomy, extending her dominion over Egypt as well. Her general, Zabdas, played a crucial role in these campaigns. All these rulers played a role in the upheaval of the 3rd century CE, contributing to the crisis that enveloped the Roman Empire. The ability of these leaders to exploit the vulnerabilities of Rome was compounded by the empire's internal issues and the frailty of its bureaucratic and administrative systems. Rome's vastness and the incapacity to devise a more effective model of rule left the empire in a state of vulnerability. The promise of delivering results, irrespective of the consequences, became the preeminent criterion for elevation to the throne. Consequently, many of the rulers of this era failed the empire and its people, while the challenges faced by Rome were not entirely novel, what set this era apart was the incapacity of the emperor to resolve them. It became a period defined by uncertainty and instability, where military popularity often overruled visionary leadership. As a result, external adversaries like Niva and Shapur I, as well as erstwhile allies like Postumus and Zenobia, seized significant advantages. Postumus and Zenobia even established their own empires. However, the twilight of this chaotic era would see a new era dawn with the ascent of Emperor Aurelian in 270 CE. Prior to his reign, the majority of emperors in the 3rd century had failed to effectively address these myriad challenges, leaving Rome and its subjects in a precarious state. 
Amidst the chaos that gripped the Roman Empire during the 3rd century CE, there emerged a formidable eastern adversary, Shapur I. Shapur I, the son of Ardisha, the founder of the powerful Sasanian dynasty, was groomed as a co-ruler by his father and trained in the art of warfare. Though he proved to be a capable administrator, Shapur I saw himself primarily as a warrior king, driven by his ambition and military prowess. His reign was celebrated by many, except Roman writers. Shapur I inherited his father's policy of aggression toward Rome. Early in his reign, he captured Roman fortresses and cities in Mesopotamia. He crossed swords with the young Emperor Gordian III, who, at the age of 17, heavily relied on the counsel of his father-in-law and praetorian prefect, Gaius Timosithius. Initially, Shapur I was repelled by the Roman forces, however, when Timosithius succumbed to the plague, the situation took a turn. Gordian III, inexperienced in warfare, was unable to counter Shapur I's strategies effectively. Failing to meet the expectations of his troops, Gordian III was overthrown and replaced by Philip the Arab. Philip swiftly sought peace with Shapur I, agreeing to pay him a hefty sum of 500,000 dinars as part of the treaty. Philip also conceded the contested territory of Armenia to Shapur I, who entrusted the region to his son Hormizd I. As viceroy of Armenia, Hormizd I, who had fought alongside his father against the Romans, governed the region adeptly. He continued his father's policies of religious tolerance and presided over a period of peace and prosperity. An astute administrator and a courageous warrior, Hormizd I earned widespread respect during his short rule in Armenia. Regrettably, Philip later disregarded the treaty, reclaimed the Armenian territory, and plunged the region back into war. Shapur I, along with Hormizd I, invaded Mesopotamia and successfully conquered the Roman province of Syria, even capturing the city of Antioch. The Roman Emperor Valerian took up the challenge, but as the plague ravaged his army during pursuit, he was forced to retreat back to Antioch. Shapur I and Hormizd I laid siege to the city, compelling Valerian to seek terms. Valerian, accompanied by his senior staff, met with the Persian leaders to discuss the city's surrender, but they were taken captive instead. The city of Antioch capitulated to the Sassanid forces, and Valerian met an undignified end, with some accounts claiming that Shapur I used his body as a footstool to mount his horse. Shapur I's remarkable campaigns had brought him close to realizing his ambition of conquering the eastern Roman provinces. However, he made a fateful mistake when he rebuffed an offer of alliance from Odanthus, the Roman governor of the Syrian city of Palmyra. Odanthus was likely seeking a degree of order for his region amidst the prevailing chaos in Rome, and Shapur I would have appeared to be a more appealing choice than any of the Roman emperors. However, Shapur I haughtily dismissed the proposal, asserting that Odanthus should anticipate becoming his vassal. Furious and insulted, Odanthus marshaled his forces and expelled Shapur I from Roman territory. The tables had turned, and Odanthus demonstrated his prowess by repeatedly defeating the Sassanid Persians. Shapur I, having lost his earlier gains, was compelled to retreat within his own borders. The remainder of his reign was primarily occupied with domestic concerns, and he maintained a cautious peace with Rome. Upon Shapur I's death, he was succeeded by his son Hormizd I, who carried forward his policies. This era marked a kind of cold war between the Sassanid Persians and Rome. While Hormizd I refrained from overtly hostile gestures toward Rome, there were no signs of warm relations between the two states. In the west, a new power was rising. Odanthus, the Roman governor of the Syrian city of Palmyra, had repelled the Persian threat and was rewarded with expanded authority by Emperor Gallienus, who designated him as the governor of all the eastern Roman provinces. However, Odanthus's life was tragically cut short while hunting in 267-268 CE. His wife, Queen Zenobia, assumed the role of regent for their young son, Vabalathus. Yet, it soon became evident that Zenobia harbored grander ambitions than merely serving as a regent. Zenobia inherited not only Odanthus's territory but also his military and the brilliant Egyptian general Zabdas. Although she avoided antagonizing Roman Emperor Gallienus and maintained an official role as a Roman regent, she steadily expanded her domain and entered into negotiations without Rome's consent. Through a clever maneuver, she sent Zabdas to Egypt to quell a revolt. 
which he likely instigated to create a pretext, and subsequently annexed the province. She could argue that her actions were in Rome's best interest, but the fact that she acted without consulting the emperor and acquired Egypt without imperial consent elevated her reputation at Rome's expense. Zenobia's assertiveness extended to issuing her own currency and adopting royal titles reserved for the emperor and his family. Moreover, she initiated negotiations with the Sassanid Persians. While these actions bolstered her position as the de facto empress of her realm, she could justify each of these moves as being for the benefit of Rome. Meanwhile, the situation in the West was taking a turn of its own. Postumus, the Roman governor of Upper and Lower Germany under the co-rule of Galenus and Valerian, grew increasingly frustrated with his inability to govern effectively. While Valerian was occupied with campaigns in the East and Galenus focused on his own endeavors in the West and North, Postumus decided to seize more power and authority. In a bold move, he marched on the Roman city of Cologne, where Galenus's son and heir had been sent for his safety. There, Postumus executed the young heir and his bodyguard. Following this, Postumus declared himself emperor of the Gallic Empire, encompassing Germany, Gaul, Hispania, and Britannia. He established his own senate, raised his own legions, and initiated his own negotiations. Throughout these actions, he insisted that he was acting in the best interests of Rome. After Valerian was captured by Shapur I, Postumus grew even bolder, and Galenus attempted to attack the Gallic Empire but was repelled. Galenus later fell victim to a mutiny in his own ranks. Claudius Gothicus and his brother Quintilus briefly assumed the imperial throne before the rise of Emperor Aurelian. Aurelian's triumph and Rome's greatest foe. Aurelian, a man of the sword rather than politics, didn't dwell on the reasons behind Zenobia's or Postumus's actions. He had no time for such inquiries. Immediately after defeating the Goths, including the formidable Cannibords, or Cliver, as well as the Vandals, Jugunthi, and Alamanni, he turned his attention to the Palmyrene Empire. At the Battle of Imae in 272 CE, Aurelian orchestrated a cunning maneuver. His cavalry engaged the enemy and then cunningly feigned a retreat. As the Palmyrene cavalry pursued, they fell into a trap. Aurelian's forces turned the tide, killing most of their adversaries and dispersing the rest. Ime marked a resounding victory for Aurelian, but Zenobia and Zabtas managed to escape and regroup. At the Battle of Emesa, employing the same tactical stratagem as at Ime, Aurelian once again routed Zenobia's forces, with Zabtas presumably meeting his end during the battle. Zenobia, in her desperate bid to escape, was eventually apprehended and brought to Rome. Initially, Aurelian displayed mercy towards Palmyra and many of its leaders. However, when the city revolted once more, he swiftly returned and razed it to the ground, a grim episode that resulted in the massacre of its inhabitants. After dealing with Palmyra, Aurelian turned westward, heading for the Gallic Empire. By this time, Postumus had already met his demise, having been killed by his own troops in 269 CE, when he attempted to prevent them from sacking the Roman city of Mainz, which had rebelled. The position of emperor had shifted among a few individuals, Marius, Victorinus, and Domitianus, before Tetricus I was nominated by Victorinus' mother. While Postumus had been an effective administrator and commander, his successors, including Marius, Victorinus, and Domitianus, proved to be far weaker and less capable. Marius, likely a foot soldier or blacksmith, was briefly in power. He was probably chosen by the troops in Mainz, particularly because he had opposed Postumus's order to spare the city. Shortly after, Marius was assassinated. Victorinus, a Praetorian tribune, then assumed the role of emperor. Despite being a skilled military leader, his insatiable lust for women led to his downfall when he tried to seduce the wife of one of his commanders. Following Victorinus's death, the usurper Domitianus seized power but was eventually overthrown by Tetricus I. Tetricus I was regarded as Postumus's true successor due to his personal integrity and strong military and administrative skills. Following Postumus's assassination, Hispania abandoned the Gallic Empire and declared loyalty to Rome. Concurrently, several Germanic tribes rebelled against Gallic rule from Trier. Victorinus had attempted to quell these revolts with varying degrees of success, but he was unable to restore stability to the region. This turbulent scenario awaited Tetricus I when he ascended to the throne. 
To alleviate the growing unrest, Tetricus I appointed his son, also named Tetricus, as his co-emperor to share the responsibilities of military and administrative governance. He then focused on stabilizing Germania and Gaul. However, his initiatives were interrupted when word arrived that Aurelian had vanquished Zenobia and was advancing towards the Gallic Empire. Upon hearing that Aurelian was marching against him, Tetricus I supposedly dispatched a letter, pleading with the emperor to save him and his son while offering to surrender. The authenticity of this account has sparked considerable debate among scholars, with some suggesting that it could have been a later fabrication by Aurelian to discredit Tetricus I by accusing him of betraying his troops to save himself. Many believed that Tetricus I was a capable leader and highly esteemed by his troops. Therefore, it seemed improbable that he would broker a surrender deal prior to the battle while still committing his army to the field. Whether or not such a deal transpired, the Roman forces clashed with the troops of the Gallic Empire at the Battle of Chalons in 274 CE. This confrontation ended with the slaughter of the Gallic forces, and Tetricus I and his son were captured. They were spared, as were other officials in the Gallic government. This sparked rumors that Tetricus I had betrayed his troops. Tetricus I received an administrative position in a Roman province, as did his son. Similar to Zenobia, he lived out the remainder of his life in comfort. Aurelian had indeed restored the empire, but he wouldn't have the opportunity to enjoy his accomplishments for much longer. He had managed to overcome numerous challenges, defeating the Goths and other invading tribes, holding the Persians at bay, reintegrating both the Gallic and Palmyrian empires into the Roman fold, and rectifying abuses within the Roman mint, thereby stabilizing the currency. It appeared that his reign was poised to continue on a trajectory of reform and restoration. However, his life was cut short by those he had unwisely placed his trust in. In accordance with the spirit of the times, even an exceptional emperor like Aurelian couldn't ultimately triumph over the challenges posed by his own people. He met his end at the hands of his commanders, who mistakenly believed he intended to execute them. During the 3rd century CE, Rome grappled with many external adversaries. Nevertheless, the most perilous threat to its existence was itself. The difficulties confronting Rome at this time, as previously mentioned, were not entirely novel, the empire had faced invasions and internal issues for decades and even centuries. What was new, however, was Rome's incapacity to resolve these problems. Impatience and policy defined Rome's climate in the 3rd century CE. Many decisions were grounded in fear rather than hope. In this environment, external problems, such as incursions by the Goths and Sassanid Persians, gained prominence. Leaders like Zenobia and Postumus found opportunities to establish their own empires. In the past, Rome would have promptly and decisively addressed such situations. In the 3rd century CE, they were either mishandled or ignored until the reign of Aurelian. In this manner, Rome became its own worst adversary during this period. By the 3rd century CE, the empire was plagued by corruption, a decline in the moral and social foundations provided by pagan religion, and the movement of various peoples across its borders. These factors culminated in imperial decisions motivated by immediate and popular outcomes. While Rome undoubtedly faced tangible external threats, the victories of these adversaries were symptomatic of the decay of the once mighty Roman Empire.